going to depress your date. Uh, he's going to like this. Uh, this is the headline last week. Same groups that soon in, in the early 90s are, guess what? Back at it again for more protection for the same spotted owl that supposedly saved uh, 22 years ago. <laughs> solids were 
a sand clay mixture. Those of you that, uh, I mean, it's a long time, uh, Doug, think back to FFA in high school, and uh, <laughs> in the soil, uh, soil class you may have had, uh, there's something called the angle of repose uh, for, for soils, and that basically it's how they stack up, how do they stand up when they're dry. Uh, the angle of repose for that is, is uh, higher than actually the composition of the soil that's behind the dams. What does that do? That means less sediment actually goes into the river when you model it. Okay, so they chose the most stable substrate possible to put in the model to limit the amount of impact that that sediment may have on the, on the river. So when we talk about the 21 million cubic yards of sediment being flushed into the river, it's hopeless focus. Um, it's hopeless focus for another reason, too. All you know, you go out there and you, you, you have a block ditch, take a back home, you take a, a, a chunk of dirt out of, the, out of the ditch. What happens? Well, you get back cutting, right? Your, your water starts to cut back. It's, it's called head cutting in, in a hydrological model. And that head cutting continues back until it, it reaches equilibrium. Well, it's that piece in what's called a two-dimensional model that was used to model the set of quantities that would go down the river. I always know, or should know, that that's not the only effect. Because the other continued aggravation of sediments that will be released into that river happen over a period of time whereby you get side collapse and things from the undermining of this process itself. Yet they chose not to use a three-dimensional model, again, to constrain the effect. Uh, what did that do for us? That produces an artificial outcome of limiting the actual plumes effect on the river itself. And I am confounded to understand how an agency that did this work can state in one part of the document that this will kill all aquatic life for two years in the river, kill three cohorts of salmon, and without the fisheries, uh, the hatcheries in place, somehow in five years we're going to have a recovered ecosystem that has fish abundantly. Uh, and I've taught this subject, and I know how many decades it takes to rebuild aquatic life and an aquatic ecosystem. Uh, we're, we're messing with, uh, with a system here uh, that would be decades of coming back uh, after this is done. The, um, the other piece that concerns me is this, all this talk started some time ago. Um, I mean, I. I started paying attention to this in about 1995, six, somewhere around in there. When I got back here in 98, really started to pay attention to what was going on. Well, what's changed? You know what's changed since then. The, the weather's changed. And all of the high flows that are promised in the dam removal are predicated on snowpack that doesn't happen anymore uh, in the upper part of the basin around Crater Lake. Why is that important? Well, it's important in that I, I'm not going to jump up and down and, and get all hysterical over global warming because I, I'm not part of that uh, hysteria that occurs. Uh, but I will tell you that from a scientific standpoint, there, there, there are climate cycles that our climate goes through. And in California, uh, particularly in this part of, the, part of the world, we have climate cycles that, that reach about 700 years. And every 600 years, we have very long droughts. We've not experienced those as a, as a state, uh, but we are headed into one. And the, the researchers who are climate deniers uh, will tell you that, that what they've done is they, they use uh, paleoclimatology, which means they study fossils and tree rings and those kinds of things, and they go back thousands of years to look at, at what, the, what the cycle is. So we just came out of a 100-year wet cycle. Um, and that wet cycle is characterized by more moisture, cooler temperatures, and three-year droughts. Sounds like California. Uh, the next 600 years, if they're right, says that we have droughts that left last 50 years. It's documented. It's there. Uh, this state likes to deny it and stick their head, head in the sand and say we don't need more water storage. Well. Only a fool, in my estimation, picks dams out facing what we're going to face 
or like to face, if history repeats itself, and I, I do believe it will. So, with that said, uh, <clears throat> they, they also did not uh, listen to the county's issues on noxious weeds and the noxious weed spread in the uh, sediments behind the dam that would remain uh, bare. They didn't pay any attention to the developed land values uh, there, and they also wrote off any recreation opportunity that we might lose as a result of the dams being removed. So in all, you know, it's, um, it spells, it spells a, a real bad decision, and one that affects my district probably almost the heaviest. Uh, because this portion of the river runs through District 5. And the communities that depend on this river are located in, in District 5. Now I know in the future my concern is that, and this is what I asked Mr. Bezdek when he was here, I said, so what happens if you are wrong? <laughs> I, you know, yeah, he just kind of, I don't know, didn't, didn't answer much, but uh, I'll tell you what, what happens when wrong and I told him, I said, all of what you consider to be lollipops and roses becomes a liability to me and, <clears throat> and the other supervisors in Siskiyou County. We can't tolerate it and we can't tolerate it because I believe, uh, you know, Siskiyou County is kind of on the ropes uh, with its industry. We get a lot of uh, litigation against us. The logging industry is largely shut down. Fires are rapidly consuming anything that I left on the landscape. In order to turn uh, our economy around, we, we depend on natural resources. I don't see anything uh, besides what we've always had coming in to save our grace uh, here in, in Siskiyou County. And I, I look at this as, as probably one of the greatest death blows uh, that we would suffer uh, with dam removal. What will it do? Talk about the river in three seconds. You have, a lower, you have a lower section down down near the mouth, uh, largely controlled by tribal interests, tribal fishing, uh, that sort of activity. And you have up the basin folks uh, with a, a dispute between the tribes and the irrigators up there, dictating to the what's going to happen. Unfortunately, the middle, us, will bear the brunt of this from the perspective of if it fails, the burden for picking up the pieces and making it work are the Shasta and Scott Rivers. It doesn't take a rocket scientist just to put that together to know what that would spell for agriculture in, in those two uh, river basins. So that's why I'm concerned. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, since I've been on the board, uh, our board is consistently opposed to this continued irresponsible act by the federal government. No, we can do that. Do the bios of the speakers.
uh, in-stream flow negotiator for uh, the KBRT, the Klamath Basin Range uh, Land Trust, which was founded by her father, Jim Root, and her family uh, owned Sabroso Foods, which uh, started in the pear industry and branched out into other fruit industries. She holds a degree in geology, focused on geomorphology from the University of Washington and degrees in geology and environmental sciences from Duke University. So she's an uh, Oregonian and she wants to stay Oregonian and uh, she says she can be impartial. <laughs> this is what the Klamath Basin Compact looks like. Not a big document, but an important document. It's a treaty. It's a treaty between two states and the United States. And it sets forth in its terms a specific way in which the Commission is to deal with the rights and duties that are contained therein. So what I say is the compact trumps the KDRA. The compact, the compact was never dealt with in the EIR, EIS, except one paragraph in there which recognized its existence, period. That's all they did. The fact of the matter is that uh, Kristen has a very heavy job in front of her because she has an employer who put her in there who's looking for a specific result. And the fact of the matter is she doesn't have much to say about how that result is carried out because, again, the compact sets forth the duties and obligations which were what were intended when that compact went into place. Let's go back in history a little bit and try to understand why the compact originated in the first place in 1957. Beginning in the late 40s, you had a tremendous growth going on in California. The World War II was over with, people were building homes, Southern California was growing, Central Valley was growing, agriculture was getting big, and people of vision were looking around for where can we get water? And where did they look? They were looking to Northern California. They looked up here and they looked to Southern Oregon. So there's a commonality of interest that developed between Southern Oregon and Northern California, in particular Siskiyou County. And in those days, these uh, counties had representatives, which we don't have today in terms of our senators that were then uh, before the 60s when we had the uh, one man, one vote, and they changed the whole representation process, leaving rural counties basically out in the cold. But back in those days, we had a very famous, very strong senator, Senator Randolph Collier. Randolph Collier was nobody to tussle with. He knew where he was going, he knew how to get there. He was known sometimes, alternately, as the uh, silver-haired fox, and sometimes as the fastest gavel in the West. Well, Randolph Collier was a smart man. He saw that this stuff was coming down the road, that people were after the water up here. So he and other people in Southern Oregon decided that they should have a compact. They should develop a way to protect this water. And I'm going to read something to you from 1952. This is from a man named Frank Lathrop. Frank Lathrop that Bob and I discovered in our studies was very instrumental as a person who actually attended the meetings and represented Siskiyou County Board of Supervisors. He was hired by the board, he worked out a water plan for Siskiyou County, and he incorporated that later in a document with Edmund G. Brown, which is a Bulletin 83. Bulletin 83 was passed on May 2nd, 1960. But back to my history. So, in the late 40s, you had this pressure going on about water, and there were plans to actually move water from Southern Oregon and Northern California through canals down to Southern California and Central uh, California. So, in 1952, here's a letter from Lathrop, who was working with Collier. Yours and my efforts have, since the beginning, been directed to obtaining a program that would provide the essential material that would aid us in formulating a policy and pattern for setting up legislative machinery for the creation of an interstate compact 
This, from our long experience, was the only program that would enable the people in the entire Klamath Basin to accomplish the ultimate objectives and the only machinery to make such effective. You and I have visualized this situation as requiring two major elements. And he goes in and he names those elements and uh, he presented a report to the Board of Supervisors which was adopted by the Board and later became part of Bulletin 83 which includes a way of protecting the excess waters in Siskiyou County from invasion by other interests. So the compact was originated by Randolph Collier and his people, they were the original people who thought about it. So Siskiyou County has a vested interest, and our Board of Supervisors has a vested interest. The people of Siskiyou County have a vested interest in what happens with the compact. It's been bastardized by people in the federal administration and these various uh, NGO groups, environmental groups, who wanted to uh, basically go around the compact. And I want to read you a testimony of Neil Coonan, which is instrumental to this effect. In uh, March 30, 1993, Neil, uh, you may know, as you may recall, was mentioned by Bob. She was a, a director of the Klamath Basin Commission at the time. She was. She writes. In our testimony, I am also the immediate past chairman and federal representative on the Klamath River Basin Combat Commission. Then she goes on to talk about the amendment, talking about KBRA and this process that was originated, is a violation of the terms of the compact, which is the law of the Upper Klamath River. She goes on in this uh, document that she put together, she talks about all the reasons they got there, and then she says, this compact has the status of a statute in the United States as well as a statute of both Oregon and California. The compact further guarantees adequate water to irrigate an additional 300,000 acres of land, 200,000 in Oregon, and 100,000 in California. She lays this all out in her document. And uh, so when you come back to the compact, remember it was passed by Congress and signed by the President of the United States. The only way you can change a treaty is to have two-thirds of the Congress vote to change it. That's the only way you can do it. And that's why I contend that the various interests here have tried to basically go around the compact as an issue because they can't deal with that situation. Now, we need to hold the feet to the fire on this thing and make sure that the commission when it's enacted and it has a meeting, that they're aware of the fact of the history of the compact, why it's there, how it was originated, what is Siskiyou County's role in the development of the compact, and why it was put into place. There's a second piece in this water control legislation that went into place, and that was put together by Pauline Davis, who was an assemblywoman at the time, and that originated in what Bob mentioned earlier, the Flood Control Conservation District. That was the second part of the water protection plan that Collier had put into place. And what that called for, basically, in the, going back to Bullet 83 now, was, and it's very thorough, this is the document right here, very thorough, it provides for a way to preserve the excess waters, runoff waters, that otherwise would go into the Klamath Basin and out to the ocean, the 14 million acre feet that run out every year into the ocean. And the way they were going to do it is by having a series of dams along the Shasta Valley side and the Scott Valley side that would uh, retain water from the runoff, excess runoff, is what they talked about, and that also included a series of upper level, upper elevation dams in Scott Valley and over in Shasta, the purpose of which was to hold water back and release it as needed later in the year. Now those dams were built, some of them, up there, but they were allowed to deteriorate, as uh, Ray and Bob can tell you, because the National Forest came into effect. Uh, they essentially let them deteriorate. But they're there, they can be rebuilt, they can put in, be put into place. And it's something that I urge uh, Siskiyou County to think about because it's an issue that's time has come to think about these things. 
I don't know if the dams will come out or not. I suspect that right now the KBRA is in trouble. They're easing about. We know that uh, BESDEC developed a plan of going out and talking to individual groups to try to find out what it would take to satisfy them to get their approval of taking the dams out. That's divide and conquer. That's what that is, a very simple process as a strategy. And Bezdek is the architect of that strategy. And he's been uh, going around our county. He's met with our board of supervisors. Uh, to only two at a time, of course, because not to break the ground act. But uh, there's a plan that's afoot to try to backdoor this process by saying, look, the citizens want it. They want to have a paper that goes into Congress and says, all these people approve of this plan and they want to make it go forward. They don't want to put it to a vote in Siskiyou County. We've already voted Measure G 80% to retain the dams. And there's no good reason to take the dams out. It's not about the fish. It's not about the fish. The dams coming out is not going to improve the fish situation at all. Anybody who studies and reads the scientific element in the EIR EIS will understand that that is the case. The hook of the salmon are not endangered. They range all the way from San Francisco, upper San Francisco Bay around the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Alaska, over to uh, Bering Straits and down to the Sea of Japan. The only thing different about this trout or this salmon is they have a particular address that they like to return to because they remember from they, when they grew up. But obviously, if you kill all these fish, for three years, if they're not around, because that's the turn cycle, they're not going to be any native trout. We're not talking about helping the native trout in this area or the native salmon. They're going to have to get them from uh, New Zealand, I think it is, or I forget where they put the, where is it? Yeah, New Zealand. They, they're raising them in New Zealand to bring them back. So what does that say about the whole process? It says that actually what's going on has nothing to do with the fish, has everything to do with the money that changes hands through the KPRA process, and that's why this thing is going on. Siskiyou County has been avoided in this process because we represent 68% of the river frontage and three of the four dams, and they don't want to deal with us. Well, that concludes my remarks. So. Before I have questions, before I take questions, we have uh, forms in the back, uh, one of which is uh, for joining uh, Siskiyou Water Users. We can use donations and we can use uh, people who actually join. I'd rather have them actually join. We have membership applications there. We also have a form for the uh, Louise Hill here. Yeah, reclaiming the forest area. So uh, we have those two that you can sign uh, and turn in. Uh, now, questions? I don't have a question, but can you tell people about the survey that went around the whole country? Well, I think a lot of people may know about it, but this is a couple years back, and I tried to do a FOIA on it with uh, the uh, DOI who hired a group out of Virginia to manage this survey. Some of you may recall that. It was a national survey. Of course, they didn't, they got some people in our area, but that wasn't what it was about. It's a national survey. And uh, during the course of the preparation of the questions, which took them over a year to test the questions to make sure they were going to get the answers they wanted, they, they actually changed the context so that a person who was reading this to answer it he was being, they were being asked, uh, would you pay, uh, I think it was $12 a year to uh, support this effort to get the dams out and so on. They didn't say anything about the $4 billion that were involved because they would have uh, screwed up the deal that way. They had to do it in that and they developed a new term of art in doing that, which the people in Virginia developed. More recently, uh, in, connection, in conjunction with what Bezdek was doing here in the last few weeks, there was a survey, which we still haven't been able to get to the bottom of, but it was a group out of Los Angeles that was doing a telephonic survey 
uh, the various individuals up here in this area, I know two of them that were talked to, who were uh, asked if they could support the KBRA. So there is a process that's going on right now to try to uh, make it appear as though there are people who want to have the dams taken out. I am Betty Hall. I represent the Shasta Nation. And uh, I'm looking at a paper that was out back for everybody, uh, a letter, a petition to, to uh, Patricia Brantham. And in the third paragraph, someone says, I've looked at the crew of tribe fraternity for this project, and they like their ideas. I think that whole paragraph should absolutely be crossed out, because they have absolutely not one good idea for any of us. <laughs> Now this is a statement from our chairman. He just read me right it while I go as I come in from work. KBRA agreement is unlawful. It's outside of the Constitution. Stakeholders making law, which they will do if the KBRA do in the KBRA. It's treason to the United States Constitution of the United States of America. A charter will be formed to govern Northern California and Southern Oregon for 50 years with no representation. They will govern all of us. And the dam removal is all scientific fraud. Yes. Now this is my own note. Our people are under the dams. They're buried there for centuries. They will be washed down the river. Their bones will be floating down the river. With hundreds more burials along the banks and hilly sites. The Shasta Aboriginal lands is from the outlet of the Upper Klamath Lake. Lake River, Lake Iwana, that's Shasta. Clear on down to Clear Creek on the Klamath River, which is below Happy Camp. The crew kept no Nothing to do with any of that area. It's not their area at all. It belongs to the Shasta people. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'd like to recognize Doug Chen over here. Doug, you want to hold up your hand? Uh, one of our citizens who's being pilloried, and all of you may know this already, but the uh, Noah and uh, Vision Game, through their infinite wisdom, have attacked them uh, for now, what, four years, three or four years now? And uh, they don't want to go to court, that is, the agencies don't want to go to court, it would appear, because they keep putting it off. They keep putting it off because they don't want a decision, because the decision may be against them. Meanwhile... Sounds like a sequel report that they're right? That's right. And so meanwhile, Doug and his family are having to put the bill, attorney bills that keep coming over and over again while this is put up. I think this is terrible. I really think we should have some kind of a resolution out of the Board of Supervisors in some fashion, a letter or a resolution in their behalf, signed by as many citizens as we can get in a few weeks, you know, at the various uh, uh, places where we can collect signatures and send it to them. This is not right that they should be suffering the way they're suffering for no good reason. Not right. Joe is one of the fighters up in Oregon who's had to deal with this issue a lot more closely than we have at this point, but some of the fate that is ahead of us, he's already experiencing. Thank you. I'm Joe Watkins. I'm the manager of the Klamath Soil and Water Conservation District. I'm here with a uh, fellow supporter, Grant Knowles. He's a farmer up in our area, and Dennis Lithicum and his wife are here, too. We've uh, been to the battle. They're, they're moving on to Siskiyou County. They figure they have Klamath County taken over. By the, by the actions that Richard said. They're going after groups, they're not going after public support. There is not public support for the KBRA in Clinton County. There is group support. One, one example of that would be the cattlemen in Clinton County. They claim support for it, they had a vote. There's 128 members, I think they had 20, 
20 votes for it, but there was only 21 votes cast. So these types of things are going on, or have already gone on in Klamath County, and now they're claiming support, and they're claiming public support even for it. But some of the things that are happening up there, uh, half of the irrigated ground in the project area is not going to be irrigated this year because of restraints on the water from the biological opinions due to endangered species and the tribal calls. And that's just in the project area. The upper basin is probably not being delivered any water. So uh, we have a $300 million economy. We're the same as you. We don't have logging. We lost like 11 mills in Klamath due to spotted owl. Now this is our second spotted owl. Uh, if the KBRA goes through, the claims that they make are that they're going to deliver X amount of water. We can't find that anywhere in the KBRA. It's a claim they're making. We don't. I personally don't believe that they can do it. I question different people, and I get different answers all the time. Uh, as far as Ray, Ray was talking, you know, some like, you know, there's a lot of people down there that are up there that support the KBRA. It's not true. They, they, they have been beaten to death and said, "Okay, quit twisting my arm. I, I give up. Maybe I can have some water." They, they, they divided us up there. And, it's divide and conquer, and they're coming down here to do to you guys. They'll, they'll do it just by Rich, what Richard said. They'll, they'll go, out, go after groups, and they'll try to buy certain people off, and that's what we're about. I, we want to come down and work with whoever wants to work and keep trying to put alternatives out there that maybe will work. We've got some ideas, and hopefully we can work with Richard and, and your uh, county supervisors to try to do something about it. Thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we learned tonight in our uh, brief meeting before we came here is that uh, there is a strong possibility that on Monday the clan of Indians are going to make a call on all the water there. So uh, that will be interesting to see, but it shows you the extent to which this process has gone to when people can bludgeon other people to get them to agree to what they want to have happen. And I know Modoc County just uh, had an ordinance, or not an ordinance, a resolution, uh, going along with KBRA, and uh, when you talk to the people, the farmers and ranchers there, who had to basically force their representative to take this forward, it's because they're being told they're not going to get any water unless they sign on. And this, this is the process that's going on, and it's going to happen here, too. Right now, they're just testing us, feeling us out, going to various groups, trying to make this thing work for themselves. But the fact is, the KBRA is an immoral and a defunct organization. And we can't let them succeed.